There's another study that's just been done by Chuck Rayzon and Andy Miller in the US. So they looked at, this, uh, at, at a juice called infliximab. So infliximab is a antibody which binds to tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. And those of you who are awake might remember I said that the three biomarkers most positive in depression are TNF alpha, CRP, and interleukin-6. So they picked TNF alpha. Why did they pick it? Because somebody made an antibody. They normally use this for rheumatoid arthritis. So they gave it to people who are depressed. And on the left-hand side of the figure, you can see bugger all. Right. So that's what, a bug, what bugger all looks like on a, on a slide. But then they did something interesting. They stratified for C-reactive uh, C -reactive protein at baseline. And there's the suggestion, and it's post hoc, and you can't ever believe post hoc, that those people who had the highest levels of C-reactive protein got some benefit, but the people who had very low levels of CRP actually got worse. So on aggregate, nothing happened. But this may well just be a statistical artifact. It may not be true, but it makes mechanistic sense that an anti-inflammatory should work in people with inflammation and not in people who don't have inflammation. So I, my own take in this, and we are too late to have learned this lesson, that the next generation of anti-inflammatory studies should stratify people for inflammation at baseline. You shouldn't take all comers. You should, only, you should measure inflammation and only put people on the study if they have inflammation. So now I'm going to finish off with statins. Statins. Why the hell is a psychiatrist talking to you about statins? Because they're anti-inflammatory. So it doesn't matter which statin you look at, pravastatin, simvastatin, etorvastatin, they're all anti-inflammatory. So this is a study comparing pravastatin and etorvastatin. You can see this really nice reduction <coughs> in inflammation, <coughs> greater in etorvastatin than pravastatin, but you can see both of them are going down very nicely. So we a couple of years ago, did this little study. Again, this is all from the Geelong osteoporosis study. We interrogated the data to see, in those people who are taking statins, did they have a lower risk of developing depression? So we only looked at people who had never before been depressed and looked at these are the people who take statins, these are the people who are not taking statins. And you can see uh, a great chasm of white light between the green and the blue lines. Odds ratio, 0.2. 0.2 means 80% risk reduction. 80% risk reduction. So these are what we would call too good to be true data. Can't believe them, can't trust them, got to replicate them. So we've been spending the last five years essentially trying to replicate and capitalize on these data. So we've just, uh, we've just finished this in men. Now, we had a much smaller sample of men, and the, the, uh, the rates of depression in men are much lower, so the doubt is nowhere near as strong. But here you can see statins, on statins, off statins. This is aspirin, on aspirin, off aspirin. And if you look at pooled aspirin and statins, you can see that it seems to be preventive. Much weaker, nowhere near as robust. We then happened to have another data set available. So this was a PhD student who was looking at depression after a cardiac event and looked at, uh, followed these people up for nine months. And she looked at a whole lot of things, but we were able to, in the study, look at who was given a statin and who wasn't. And what she found was that at three months, people who were taking statins, adjusting for all confounders, had a 69% reduction in the risk of developing depression. And at nine months, 79% reduction in the risk of developing depression. Now, I'll tell you why this is even more surprising. Because if you think about it, who gets statins? Fat, hyperlipidemic, couch potatoes, who got cardiovascular risk factors. And what are your risk factors for depression? Fat, hyperlipidemic, couch potato, poor diet, smokers. So the things that would give you a prescription for statins are more likely to be causing depression. So if anything, the causality should go the other way around. If there's a, So the fact that you get a risk reduction is even more surprising. Other people have now replicated this. So this is a study called the, the Health and Soul Study. And they followed people up who were given statins and not given statins and found a 48% decrease in depression risk. And after adjusting for confounders, they found a 38% reduction in depression risk. So we've now got meta-analysis level of evidence for statin use and risk for depression. 
and you can see an overall reduction in risk in people taking statins. The next question is, if you have depressed people, if you give them statins, could this possibly be useful? And we now have studies that look at this. So the first study, prize for anybody who tells me where the study was done? Iran, Iran correct. <laughs> <laughs> so they looked at lovastatin plus fluoxetine, lovastatin plus placebo, and here you can see a statistically significant effect of lovastatin in the treatment of depression. So we were very excited to see this because it suggested that our hypothesis was right. We were a little bit disappointed because they've gazumped us. But such is life. And then this paper came out at the end of last year. So they looked at statins compared to escitalopram in, in the treatment of depression in people with a coronary heart syndrome. So I'll just, just concentrate on the left-hand figure, which is HAMD response at 24 weeks. So let me just point on the other screen, HAMD response at 24 weeks. So green line is escitalopram plus statins. Blue is escitalopram, yellow is statins, pink is no meds. So you can see escitalopram and statins are as good as each other for the treatment of depression. Both is better than either one alone, and both are better than placebo. I mean, this is beautiful data. This is really beautiful data. Again, so we now have two studies suggesting that, es that statins might be antidepressants. Um, it's just amazing where the field is going to. So this is again a very new paper, which is a meta-analysis of all anti-inflammatory drugs and cytokine inhibitors in the treatment of depression. And you can again just look at the bottom triangle, it's on the left of the dividing line, bottom triangle on the left of the dividing line, suggesting an overall effect of anti-inflammatory drugs in the treatment of depression. Yeah. Yes, we've just got one published. Negative. 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 Yeah. I'd like to ask that there was a very early paper in Lancet when the statins came in that actually showed the association of the use of statins with severe depression, particularly in males, if I remember rightly. Yeah, not been replicated, not yeah. upheld by the more recent data. Right. Uh, so that was a, again, that was a post hoc analysis of, a, of, a, of another clinical trial. No, I, I think it's true to say that. All the more recent evidence suggests that the opposite is the, the case. So that finding has not been upheld by any of the more recent literature. And this is a bit of a left field question because I know there's lots of theories about how ECT works, but how does ECT fit into all of this because it's so effective in severe depression? It's, not, it's a very, very good question. I'm not sure that this model necessarily explains how ECT works. I mean, well, ECT, as you'd know. Yeah, I mean, the only thing, I mean, apart from arguments about uh, neurotransmitters and neurogenesis and all those kinds of things, it doesn't clearly link to an anti-inflammatory hypothesis that I'm aware of. So we just, uh, we're running this little study. Um, so this is in youth depression. So Yoda stands for youth depression alleviation, and A stands for anti-inflammatory, so Yoda A. Uh, there are three Yoda studies. There's Yoda A for anti-inflammatories, Yoda C for CBT, and Yoda F for fish oil. But this is the Yoda A. So essentially, we're randomizing people to aspirin compared to rosuvastatin compared to placebo. It's a three-month study with a one-year follow-up, and in 20, what's it? 2019, I'll be able to tell you whether it's useful or not. So let me finish at this point, because it's lunchtime. Um, we have a number of potential targets, a number of things that we can do. Uh, we've got mitochondrial dysfunction, we've got oxidative stress, we've got neurogenesis, we've got inflammation, we've got neurotransmitters. Each one of these carries with it a whole raft of potential novel therapeutic targets. And I hope I've been able to convince you that there are, there is hope that there are potential new therapies for the treatment of psychiatric disorders. They're pretty much all coming from repurposing existing drugs. Uh, we're not getting much from novel molecular targets, but the hope is that if we really get to drill down in what the inflammatory and immune targets are, we can get even better drugs. So I'm gonna stop at this point. I don't know if we've got time for any questions, otherwise I'll take them at lunch. Probably have time for one question and then we've got a break for lunch. So we'll just
much. Professor Burke, just the, the issue of um, integrating this data with the um, other biological aberrations we see with, with depression, and what I'm talking about there is platelet dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction, elevated cortisol levels, BDNP with uh, uh, neurogenesis. And uh, the second part of that is looking at the traditional place of the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors in both rheumatoid and seronegative psoriatic arthropathy and seeing if there's any, I suppose, scope uh, to see particularly in those groups. I mean, you've spoken about elevated CRPs, but looking at the, the clinical spectrum of uh, the conditions where uh, TNF are um, elevated. Uh, elevated and targets for pharmacotherapy within uh, rheumatology. Well, you're absolutely correct. I think that, um, I mean, one of the things we've known for an awful long time is that pretty much any disorder where you get elevated levels of systemic inflammation, you've got very much higher rates of depression than the general population. And the rheumatologists have known this for an awful long time. And it doesn't really matter which inflammatory disease it is, whether it's lupus or whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, but most autoimmune disorders associate with very high levels of, of, of mood symptomatology. Um, there are newer TNF-alpha antagonist studies that are being done. Um, so Roger McIntyre is leading one, and he is stratifying for levels of inflammation prior. So hopefully that might be possible. Uh, that might be a positive study. In terms of endothelial dysfunction and platelet dysfunction, absolutely, these are biomarkers that are now well established. Believe it or not, I did my PhD on platelets and depression. So I'm, I'm a great believer that this is an abnormality. And one of the arguments in the aspirin field, for example, is maybe this is why aspirin's working, that it's actually a vascular cerebral blood flow factor. And I think that it's going to be quite hard to untangle these things. Uh, and generally what happens in, in, in these studies is you first find an effect and then you start to untangle what these treatments might be doing in terms of its neurobiology. So it's very much a process of reverse engineering these clinical findings. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.